a jealous wife armed with pointy things and a pair of bloody feet? What was fueling Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers' relationship? By the time Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire became an on-screen duo, they'd already danced together. As Rogers describes in her autobiography, Ginger, My Story, she and Astaire first met in 1930 on the set of Broadway's Girl Crazy. Alexander Leftwich, the production's director, didn't invest much energy into the show. So producers called in Astaire to polish the dance numbers. The dancers, including Rogers, performed for him. At some point, Astaire stepped in for Rogers' partner, and they danced the first of many more duets to come. Rogers wasn't dazzled. He was just a man summoned to polish a few rough spots. There was no reason to be particularly impressed. I honestly didn't think of him again. The couple's undeniable on-screen spark never evolved off-screen. On the contrary, the couple was known for their professionalism when working together. But in her autobiography, Rogers confesses there was a moment where there was a real-life spark. In 1930, Astaire called Rogers and asked her on a date, and she said yes. He wore a suit and a silk tie while she chose a silk chiffon dress, both dressed in dark blue. They went for dinner and dancing at the casino in Central Park. Musician Eddie Duchin commented on how good they looked together, and Rogers, quote, felt as though she could have danced all night. They didn't, but they did share a passionate kiss in the car afterwards. According to Rogers, it lasted five minutes. After this brief encounter, neither Astaire nor Rogers acted on their mutual attraction. But as Rogers recalls, If I had stayed in New York, I think Fred Astaire and I might have become a more serious item. We were different in some ways, but alike in others. Both of us were troopers from an early age, both of us loved a good time, and for sure, both of us loved to dance. Fred Astaire's life revolved around dance because of his sister Adele. While everyone thought she was destined for fame, he trained as her supporting act. They had success on Broadway and in London's West End, but everything came to a halt when Adele married a British aristocrat and left the industry. Everyone said, oh, poor Fred, what will he ever do without her? Astaire was heartbroken and considered a career as a soloist. Then he was teamed with Ginger Rogers in 1933's Flying Down to Rio. The chemistry was too good for the movie studios to pass up, so they offered the pair a second movie. Upon hearing the proposal, Astaire replied to the producer, What's all this talk about me being teamed with Ginger Rogers? I will not, underscore, not have it, Leland. Rogers knew about his feelings, but didn't give them much notice and never opposed the idea of them being a couple on screen. For every film I did with Fred Astaire, I did three or four without him. Our partnership was a limited one, only in his case, not in mine. For her, it was just another movie. For him, it was his whole career. Ginger Rogers' selling point was never dance. Even though she had considerable stage experience, winning Charleston competitions while she was only 15 and dancing in vaudeville and on Broadway, she wasn't a trained dancer, a fact that could be seen in her technique. She was more focused on acting skills, dancing only in movies with Astaire. Astaire, on the other hand, achieved mythical heights when it came to dance. He was known for his tap dancing in the minds of millions. Rogers became his perfect partner. She modeled her movement after his and developed a technique which matched his brilliance without overshadowing it or being overpowered herself. The result was magical. Fred Astaire was known for his perfectionism. He was demanding of his partners, stating toward the end of his life, all the girls I ever danced with thought they couldn't do it, but of course they could. So they always cried, all except Ginger. Ginger never cried. Oh, I thought he'd never call time out. We ought to get him a whip. Get me a wheelchair. Rogers was aware of her shortcomings as a self-trained dancer, and she took her work seriously. Producer Pandro S. Berman noticed how hard she worked. She has spent all of her Sundays and holidays and nights rehearsing her dances. She has spent many nights after a very long and hard day's work recording her songs, and nothing has been too hard for her, even to the extent of going to the wardrobe department after midnight and staying there until 2.15 in the morning getting fittings on clothes which were necessary for the next day's work. Rogers speaks about how her feet bled in her satin high heels during filming, but she didn't stop until they completed the scene. She quote, detested idling, a statement confirmed both by Astaire and Hermes Pan, the dance director of their movies. While they achieved worldwide fame with their incredible dance scenes, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers didn't dance together for long. In six years, they made nine movies together, plus a final one years later. Their most fruitful period was during the 1930s, the time when the musical genre reached its peak. 
The team of Astaire and Rogers debuted in 1933's Flying Down to Rio, followed by The Gay Divorcee in 1934, and in 1935, both Roberta and the legendary Top Hat. By this time, the audience was smitten with the dancing pair, and their movies consistently sold out theaters. They continued to make at least a movie per year with Follow the Fleet in 1936, and Swing Time and Shall We Dance in 1937. They made Carefree in 1938, and the story of Vernon and Irene Castle in 1939. They danced together once more ten years later in the Barclays of Broadway, when Judy Garland was replaced due to her addiction problems and Rogers was called in at the last moment. Fred Astaire had a major influence on the visual style of all the movies he appeared in. He supervised everything from camera movement to wardrobe, and he didn't hold back when it came to the clothing of other actors. During the filming of Top Hat, Rogers worked with the designer Bernard Newman on her gowns. For the iconic dance number Cheek to Cheek, she envisioned a dreamy satin dress covered with ostrich feathers, full of movement and flow. The dress was created, but when the time came to shoot the number, objections were raised. Director Mark Sandrich tried to convince Rogers to wear a different dress, but she insisted. In the end, her mother Layla, her close ally, had to intervene. Rogers wore the feather dress, and Astaire hated it. While they were dancing, feathers flew into Astaire's face, mouth, and all over the dance floor. The next day on set, Rogers was greeted with dirty looks and a wall of silence from the production team, including Astaire. But a few days later, Astaire sent her a golden feather with a note, Dear Feathers, I love ya, Fred. When Rogers and Fred Astaire met up in September 1933, after months of not seeing each other, and some letters from Astaire to which Rogers didn't reply, his attitude toward her was distant and more rigid than it had been. He'd recently married socialite Phyllis Potter, whose prim, jealous nature influenced him greatly. According to Rogers, she was somewhat insecure in her new role as a famous dancer's wife. Phyllis often visited her husband's film sets and asserted her power by loudly knitting in the corner. This agitated everyone, including Astaire. Rogers felt Phyllis never liked her and that she was concerned about how close Astaire and Rogers were. Mrs. Astaire even went as far as reading Astaire's scripts and protesting any kissing or even hugging in the story. That's the reason, Rogers believes, the pair kissed only once in all their screen appearances. The massive success of their films was often ascribed more to Fred Astaire than to Ginger Rogers. After all, he was the better dancer and choreographed some of their dance numbers himself. But while Astaire was a better dancer, Rogers was a more skillful actor. She eventually received an Academy Award for her leading role in Kitty Foyle. Rogers was well aware of how their partnership was perceived and mentioned it on several occasions, including in one interview in the 1980s. It's interesting that people refer to the Fred Astaire pictures, but you see, I was in them too, and so I take umbrage at that. Of course, I've done very well on my own, but people do think of us as a team. Some critics went as far as saying Rogers was a puppet in Astaire's hands, only following his instructions without adding anything of her own. But Rogers was a hard worker and a fighter who chose her battles carefully. She was aware of the difference between the way Hollywood treated men and women. In her autobiography, she mentions that she never missed a single day of shooting for illness, only when she was negotiating for more money. The secret to the success of Astaire and Rogers was their complementary characteristics. Astaire's impeccable dancing and Rogers' ability to adapt and improvise with him. The duo's ability to convey emotions while dancing was crucial to their popularity, especially in their romantic duets, which were sometimes cheerful and sometimes more thoughtful. Even though Astaire danced with other, more skillful partners later on, none of them compared to Rogers and her intensity of expression. Ladies and gentlemen, the best thing that ever happened to Fred Astaire, Miss Ginger Rogers. According to author Jeffrey Escoffier, Rogers and Astaire created a unique style, consisting of vaudeville, ballroom dancing, tap dancing, soft shoe, and even ballet. Catherine Hepburn commented that he gives her class and she gives him sex. While the pair indulged in romance on screen, there were rumors that they didn't get along in real life. But both Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire refused to confirm the gossip. At a tribute event for Rogers in 1979, Astaire remarked, There are all kinds of rumors that we used to fight, and we didn't. I've been denying it for the last 20 years or more. Rogers believed the rumors were a publicity ploy by the studio. According to her, they had a lot of fun together. True, we were never bosom buddies off the screen. We were different people with different interests. We were a couple only on film. 
Because we were so good together, the public tried to make something bigger out of our relationship, even when we were married to other people. Many think Ginger Rogers' career really took off only after she started to dance with Fred Astaire. They claim that Rogers' partnership with Astaire transformed her career, that prior to teaming up with him, she alternated between playing nice girls and know-it-alls, that she never fit the mold, and it wasn't until after the success of Top Hat that she really began to shine. Rogers disagreed, mentioning that while Flying Down to Rio was Astaire's second movie, it was her 20th. While our union had a special kind of magic and produced unique enchantment, it was not the be-all and end-all of my career. Astaire honored her great contribution to his career while talking to Raymond Rohauser in 1966. Ginger was brilliantly effective. She made everything work for her. Actually, she made things very fine for both of us, and she deserves most of the credit for our success.